I'm not going to talk anything about software. That you get from Don Isles and from Dick Batten, who have talked here and, and so forth. What I'm going to talk about is hardware experiences and a little history of how we got there. We started off on August 10th, 1961. The last Apollo flight was 17, and that was in 1972. Historically, all of this got started because of the Russians, or the Soviet Union at that time, with the first Soviet launch, Sputnik 1, and our number of failures of the NRL Vanguard launches. They just kept bombing out, exploding before they got, off, got very high off the land thing. The uh, first successful flight was on a uh, Jupiter rocket coming out of U.S. Army Huntsville, and that was Werner von Braun. And if he was a World War II V2, V1 director at Penamunde, and I don't know how many of you, so a lot of you are young and probably don't even know what that is, but that was the Nazi uh, missile development. And we uh, got there first and were able to abscond him and take him to the U.S., and he directed the Huntsville activity and then NASA Marshall. But our first president who was involved in this was President Eisenhower. He didn't want anything to do with space, but he got shamed into it because of the Soviet Union's ac activities. And he's the one who authorized the formation of NASA from the original NACA or NCAA or whatever that was called. We were way behind. And as you can see, the Soviets in, in the 58 and 60, man, they were pushing way ahead of us. And it wasn't until 59 that we had our first flyby. And then in 59, Mercury took off. Uh, that was authorized uh, by, uh, I think, Eisenhower or Kennedy initially. There's a little story that goes with Kennedy and we're off to the moon. And that is uh, Dr. Wiesner who was originally the president of, who was the president of MIT at that time, was also Kennedy's science advisor. And he was asked by Kennedy to write a report saying, what should we do? Should we do manned space or not? And he came in with a report which said, that's ridiculous. It costs too much money, too risky. Stay with orbiting flights. Well, the first person he had a report to was then Vice President Johnson. And Vice President Johnson was, a head, was then the head of the Space Council or something. And Johnson threw him out of the office. So he didn't want to hear that. Go away. And he invited George Lowe in. And yea, verily, the report that Johnson gave Kennedy was, yeah, we can do it. Right through 62, uh, the Soviets were still ahead of us. But Gregarian had done his successful orbit. And if you can see here, this, the, the uh, Soviets put the first man on the moon the first spacewalk, and it wasn't until 65 that we start taking the lead with Gemini and Mercury. There's a little story that goes with Mercury. When, when NASA was sent out to Langley, that's where their first setup was, they were put in a backwater building there, had very few for good facilities, wasn't even air conditioned, and, and I think they started off with a team that was called STG, Space Technology Group, with about 100 people. And, and uh, the old timers from the uh, aeronautical thing sort of looked down on him, on them. Well, they got in charge of building Mercury, and they put Mercury together and, and uh, brought it out to first, first decided, well, we'll put it on, they're going to put it on an atlas. This was the first flight, unmanned. And it wound up, it didn't fit. So the only way they could get it to fit is they went out and bought a um, router. <laughs> they routed off some of the heat shield to get it to fit. <coughs> And then they dis discovered they didn't even have a launcher, you know, a, a, a payload mechanism to take it out. Somebody got a pickup truck, threw a blanket, in, uh, a mattress in it, and that's how they got it out to the pad. So it gives you some idea of our beginnings in space. Uh, that was called Big Joe, but Big Joe didn't make it. The Atlas failed. Uh, what, when that happened, uh, Eisenhower decided to move uh, von Braun to NASA. And so von Braun was moved to NASA, and, and for some reason or other, Eisenhower said, go build me a big booster. And that's what happened. 
you can see I put some names down because these are guys that I knew of or had worked with. Uh, Grissom, as you know, he died in, in Apollo 1, and so did Ed White. Ed White and Jim McDivitt worked with me, uh, as well as a bunch of other people, in, the, in what was called the Apollo uh, Block 2 implementation meetings, and I have a picture here, and you'll see it, of some of that. I mentioned Borman and Lovell because that was, they flew on Apollo 8, and, and a lot of the Gemini stuff was kind of teaching for, about rendezvous and docking. And of course, Armstrong, Scott, Collins, Lovell, Aldrin, all key players. This is Kennedy making his famous speech, saying, we're going to go to the moon. And that was in May of 1961. A little about the instrumentation lab. I'm sure you've all heard of Dr. Draper. Dr. Draper's history goes way back. He was originally with Jaros and things. And what I discovered in reading up on Doc recently was Dr. Draper, who was then an MIT professor running an instrumentation group, his, one of his thesis candidates was Dr. Walter Wrigley. And Wrigley wrote, a pay, wrote his thesis on inertial guidance. And that turned Doc on. And that's how Doc really moved out in the inertial guidance technology with gyros and such. And if you ever looked at some of the nomographs published, they were always published with Wrigley was one of the writers. And Wrigley actually was my thesis advisor, so sort of historically, that was kind of interesting. Uh, Siemens was a student of Doc also. And John uh, and Jim Webb knew Doc from experiences with Atlant at uh, Sperry. <laughs> historically, in 1957, the Draper Lab did a study uh, led by Milt Trageser, Hal Lanning, and Dick Batten. And it was a probe to fly to Mars. Much of the algorithmic work that was developed that time carried on into Apollo and also carried into Dick's uh, book. Uh, kind of interestingly enough, there's still a model of this laying around. It happens to be in the back room where our refrigerator is. Uh, as I recall the story, this whole mission was designed to fly a camera around Mars and take one picture. It wasn't too uh, productive. But it was a beginning. Now, we had several other miscellaneous contracts between them, and one of them with, was with, at Langley, the head of the flight dynamics branch, a guy by the name of Bob Chilton. Bob Chilton eventually moved to NASA JSC and was quite a player there. And Bob had a deep respect for the laboratory. He had actually worked on some of the early programs uh, that Draper had been, or then Instrumentation Lab had been working. And he sent his recommendation uh, out to then uh, the chief of uh, at Langley, NASA at Langley, recommending that uh, the instrumentation laboratory should do the job and actually referenced Batten and Lanning and some of their work in that time frame. He was a very nice guy. I, I remember meeting him several times. First contract on Apollo was awarded to MIT Instrumentation Lab in August of 61. And, and, uh, Clearly, some of our experiences were unique in that we had already done the Polaris missile work. And much of the Polaris missile guidance system concepts were incorporated in the Apollo program. Dave Hoag, who was the technical director of the Apollo program, was uh, on the Polaris program, and so was Ralph Reagan. And in August of 61, James Webb invited Draper to come to NASA headquarters and to discuss it with him. And as you can see there, Webb asked, uh, can you really do this? And Doc said, you'll have it when you need it. And he also volunteered to fly on the first flight. Doc was a great showman. <laughs> now, this is the telegram that was sent out. I couldn't find the contract. There was a one-page contract, which Darrell may have some success finding at JSC. But this is a telegram sent by then uh, Senator Soltenstall of the U.S. Senate 
telling Doc that we're on board. And uh, I got this from the MIT Museum. We didn't have one of these, but now we got a copy of it here. And this is a picture of Doc talking to Jim Webb, Lyndon Johnson, and this fellow whose name I didn't know until Kathleen got it for me, uh, who was then the uh, president of the National Academy of Sciences that was taken in then Air Force One. Now, Doc was, as I told you, was quite a showman. And one of the things he did is he sent a letter to George Siemens. And he volunteered, this is not the whole letter. I, was, I found an archival copy of that. It was very hard to read, and so I translated some of the stuff and got it retyped. And here he was volunteering. He was 60 at that time, but he wanted to be an astronaut. And Don Flickinger, he was the key, I guess, NASA surgeon or something. But I thought the, the cool part of it was is Dr. Show, Doc's showmanship. And he said, uh, and I think it's right here. If I'm willing to hang my life on this equipment, the whole project will surely have the strongest possible motivation. And a discussion of general design and details will be most responsive to my inputs. <laughs> that was Doc. Unique guy. Uh, this is the instrumentation lab back in those days. We actually had 14 different buildings, and we were spread out all around the MIT campus. Uh, this building over here is where we did Apollo, and if I can find building five is where we, where we did Polaris, and I'm not sure where the heck we did the gyro work. And the very first building we were in was building one, and that was a, a, a converted shoe polish factory. It was the Whittemore Shoe Polish Factory. That's building seven. You can see the nice old cars, really great cars. A little bit of a gas guzzler. And my office was right there. John Miller, who was head of the hardware stuff, was right there. And Dave Hoag was over here. And I think Ralph Reagan was in that office. That building now is, was certainly torn down. And if you look across the road from, from uh, Memorial Drive, looking at that area, you'll see this luxury condominium building, which sort of has steps in it looked a little like the Israeli habitats. These are the pieces of hardware that were in Apollo. I was ultimately responsible for the inertial measurement unit. I did most of the systems engineering for the coupling data unit. And then I, I worked the signal conditioner. And that was kind of funny. You will see that, that all of these are essentially identical with the difference that the navigation base in the lunar module was different. And of course, the software was different. And the rendezvous radar was added. But other than that, the, the system's hardware was, was essentially the same. On the signal conditioner, just a quickie story. Uh, everyone sort of forgot about the signal conditioner. You know, it was one of these pieces of equipment you add on to feed into telemetry. All it had was temperature control monitors and voltage supplies and all that. And it was just forgotten. And then somebody said, we got to do the signal conditioner. Well, I being, at that time, about 29 years old, that was my assignment. I had to go out and do something. So I duplicate. I got all the circuits from the Apollo system, and I duplicated them. And then we were going to build it. And we needed magnetic amplifiers. We used magnetic amplifiers in that time in the temperature controllers. And, and the magnetic amplifier supplier said, we supplied all the stuff to Apollo. You don't need any more. And they wouldn't build any more. So I had to go out to Rhode Island uh, to talk the magnetic controls company to provide us mag amps. And finally, they said, all right, we'll give you one more shipment. And as I marched out, they gave me a big box full of charms. Apparently, they were owned by the company that made Charms Candy. <laughs> so it was quite an interesting event. Uh, key players on this program was, uh, apart from us, uh, AC Spark Plug did the gyro systems integration. Sperry then did the accelerometers. I think it was then Sperry Gyroscope Company. They're now part of Honeywell. Uh, Colesman Instrument is, uh, still exists, and Raytheon obviously exists. <laughs> Spacecraft manufacturer, the command module is North American. They don't exist anymore. They're part of Boeing. 
and the lunar module was Grumman. Uh, interestingly, and I'm not going to go through this long list, but I put it there for archival purposes. These are the hardware people I remembered that I had worked with. And uh, Stan, you're there. Some of you may remember Jim Cinema on, on the MEMS hardware. Uh, I don't know who else is. Oh, Rick is here. He worked with Jim Nevins on spacecraft simulators and mock-ups. Uh, key, player, key player in my mind was Dave Hoag, who led this program right through the whole program as technical director. John Miller uh, was quite a fantastic leader, handled hardware. His sidekick was Bob Crisp, a very creative guy who gave us the ideas on the, on the uh, CDU, electronic CDU. Norm Sears took over after him, and Dick Batten was always his sidekick in, the, in, that, in that area. My first boss was Jim Flanders, and I eventually inherited the uh, IMU. Key players, Dick McKern, Julie Feldman, George Bucco, Steph Helfand. Uh, I can't go through all the names, and I won't try, but they're there for the record. Some of you may recognize who are still Lou Martinage, who still comes in now and again. Excuse me? George, I didn't realize he's still here. Now, what was it like in 1961? That's when we did this. In 61, we didn't have any CAD cab. We didn't have any copying machines. We didn't have any personal computers. We had mechanical machines, which were Frieden calculators. And boy, were they noisy, clunk, 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 clunk. And they always broke down. Uh, and, and we only had black and white TV. And there were no jet aircraft that we flew across the country to North American and propeller-driven aircraft. And if we were lucky, we made 270 miles per hour. And we flew all day and night, literally, to get to the West Coast. And on one flight, I remember going to LA. And in the first class section was Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. And Spencer was a, quite a drinker. And Catherine kept saying, no, no, no. And, and eventually, the flight attendant brought milk out for him because he was getting heartburn. When I first came on board at, at uh, MIT in 62, uh, I had worked at Sperry before that on flight control systems. And I had been in the Signal Corps for a couple of years, also working on flight control systems for then helicopters and flight aircraft. And, and when I came on board, I had developed a flight line analyzer for the flight control system that went into uh, some of the, for the testing of the autopilot that Sperry built for several of the airplanes. So, so when I came here and interviewed, they thought I knew something about test equipment. Well, I knew nothing about digital computers. I'll tell you that. We didn't even have any. Uh, and it was kind of a funny story. And I, I'm really running behind time here. But it's a, it's a kind of a funny story. Then Delco, which was Sacy Sparkplug, uh, they were hot to have their own manufacturer provide the test table. So it wasn't, they were allied to a company called Century. And we had turned up this company, International Machine Tool Company, in Warwick, Rhode Island. And the head of that one, his name was Walter Ellsdorfer. He's still alive, and his son is now running the company. And, and uh, he built this table. We thought it was a pretty good table, a lot less expensive than Century. But Delco, or AC Spark Plug people, just objected. They said he'd never build them in time. We wouldn't get them. And so we went out there and did this uh, inspection. So we visited them. And what I thought was kind of funny, and, and he built a good table. It was kind of funny that Walter was also a bit of a showman. And he took us, after we went to that, he took us to the governor's mansion in Rhode Island. We sat down with then Governor Lincoln Chafee, or Chaffee, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. He's today a US senator. And when we were there, he promised us, he said, don't worry about it. I assure you that IMT will get this job done. And they did. But it was kind of interesting. Apollo IMU was a three gimbal system. Uh, so it had the possibility, if the middle gimbal got up high, we'd get into gimbal lock and lose control. Uh, people knew that. This, we, this was what we used in Polaris. Uh, the astronauts really wanted a four gimbal system to avoid gimbal lock. And one of the astronauts, Jim McDivitt, really was a major objector. And he said, I wouldn't fly with a three gimbal system. 
Uh, Germany had a four gimbal system. But uh, he gave in. And uh, yeah, we did go with a three gimbal system. One of the issues was that a four gimbal system was a lot heavier, bigger weight penalty. Today it wouldn't be, but then it was. And so we retained the three gimbal platform. Uh, for those of you who have no idea what an IMU is, because there are some young people here, uh, the IMU is a three gimbal uh, system which it stabilizes the stable member uh, using the gyros to maintain uh, inertial orientation and then the accelerometers, which uh, Doc always calls specific force integrators, uh, measured the velocity change for burning, for making the velocity increments. That's a picture of the Apollo Block 2 IMU with the three gimbals. And over there, I, I, we have a model of that, and it's, it's up there on the platform. We went from Block 1 to Block 2. I'll just show you a few of these pictures. Block 1 had a heavy beryllium, well, I don't think it was beryllium, uh, mount, uh, a much lar a larger IMU, and the optics assembly up there. And NASA was kind of upset about weights, and so we went to block two. And in block two, you can see we went from 64 pounds to 42 pounds. Uh, so there were design changes to move resolvers to one side of the gimbal. We got rid of three torque motors, uh, and we got rid of something called an angular differentiating accelerometer. That was used to provide damping for the rate control on the block one. But Manny Kramer, and I don't remember who else, came up with a unique way of being able to do that analytically. So Block 2 didn't need that. One of the things that was very unique is this navigation base, which was done by Phil Bowditch. You can see that stru structure that was built to maintain it. This navigation base was a thin-shelled aluminum structure filled with foam. And it worked. So big, big change. Uh, this is, I'm not going to go through this, but, but the optics in Apollo on the command module had a scanning telescope to find the field and a sextant. And the sextant was, I think, about 28 power. Yeah, it was 28 power. And that was used by the astronauts to do the star sightings to make star measurements and then use that to align the IMU before, for burns. <coughs> That's a picture of the block one system. And what I wanted to point out in block one is there was concepts of sparing in block one. And this was the power supply and servo assembly. You can see the little connectors right in the front. And these were trays that would pull out and you could replace them. The computer was similar. I only sh the picture I only had was with a few of the trays. But the computer trays pulled out, the uh, PSA trays pulled out, and also uh, in block one, there was something called coupling data units. And the coupling data units were little servo followers on the gimbals to tell the astronauts where the gimbals were. Block two, and this is pretty much what you see down in the sim lab. It's a little sim lab's going through changes. There, you can see the, the PSA now is a hermetically sealed unit. So is the computer. And uh, so was the computer, and that was then the CDUs, or the gimbal readouts. Uh, over sitting on here, on this side was, this, I think, the signal conditioner. And back over there is the, the PIPA. And in behind there was the IMU. Um, we started off, Jim Nevins had hoped we could come up with a map and data viewer, which would go up here, that never really materialized in block two. This is a nice picture of Doc when Werner von Braun, famous V2 man, visited the lab and Doc gave him an uh, explanation of the guidance system. And sitting over there in the right-hand corner is iron lats. And you can see this was a block one system with all the connectors hooked into the PSA. Now, Werner von Braun was historically, you know, the man who launched all the rocket stuff. And he uh, was arrested one time by the uh, SS the Nazi SS, because he wasn't enthusiastic enough about building missiles. Historically, the story is he always wanted to build space flight things. But uh, they arrested him, and, and after they let him go, he joined the SS. 
He always claimed to have nothing to do with all of the horrendous things that went on with the Nazis. But in fact, there are records that came out after he left NASA that he uh, requested uh, people from the concentration camps to work in his uh, factories to build them. Uh, interestingly, this is the Block 2 computer and Disky. And the Block 2 computer weighed 70 pounds, pulled 55 watts. And uh, there's a good book written by Eldon Hall on this subject, and it's available. And the way astronauts dis did things was entered, can't see it, a verb key, and an enter key, and a noun key, and that set off the right programs and told them what to do. So example, P51 set up the, uh, in P51 program, verb 41 and noun 22 allowed them to set up the gimbals for a course aligned. Some comparisons. Apollo computer, two megahertz, four kilobytes of RAM, and I did it in bytes. We did, actually had 16-bit words, but I changed it to bytes. And fixed memory was uh, 73 kilobytes. And I did a little comparison with a, a computer I bought not quite a while ago, actually. At one point, figure about four gigahertz and 512 megabytes and 440 gigabytes of, of uh, and that cost $799. This computer cost a lot more. <laughs> Interestingly enough, this computer was ultra-reliable. We used magnetic core uh, <coughs> memory devices. The problem with the magnetic core devices is your, your, your strung wires in and out of the cores, and, and uh, they were very rugged, but it took six weeks or so before you could get a core out with all of that wiring that they had to do. Uh, we introduced the first integrated circuits in this unit. And we, there were 5,600 integrated circuits, all of the same type, which made up the RAM and the logic. Uh, obviously, uh, we did extensive testing for build reliability on the gates. And what was kind of interesting, as I recall, 10,000 gates were tested separately before they ever committed to them. They were made by Fairchild, and there was this bl big issue of, of a blue nose problem. There was some kind of contamination called blue nose, which we finally got cleared in. And Windows 98 couldn't get close to an Apollo computer, and neither could any other language. And in fact, everything was, was programmed in ones and zeros. It was all very basic assembly language. This is the Apollo Block 1 CDU. And, and, uh, I was pretty much involved with the CDU, and those were repeaters. This was a, a servo repeater system with magnetic uh, gear on the, on the servo uh, gear train to indicate incremental angles. And the, we were indi indicating 40 arc seconds or 20 arc seconds in the optics. Uh, those gear trains, when you tried to follow the IMU and you did a course of line or something, it's, they spun up like mad. And the net result was they all wore out. Uh, along came an idea from Bob Crisp, who was a good idea man, with an electronics design. And what it, what it was is we had single speed, 16 speed resolvers. And if you go through the trigonometric uh, identities of sine, cosine, multiplication, and adding them together, which would come up with an expression which gave you the sign of the angle the gimbal was at minus the angle phi, which was what we set switches to. And, and that's how it worked. Very ingenious. Glenn Cushman was the electronic designer for, on that. He left the lab and started a company building electronic encoders, and he wound up being bought by Clifton. I think Clifton got bought by Lytton, and I don't know what happened to Glenn in, the, in all of those things. Uh, this is the output of the system with the computer feeding D to A's, that, which ran the engine for the service pro propulsion system on the service module. Uh, and, and DC signals were sent to the control of the Saturn. Uh, I, I wrote all the interface documents for all this stuff, as well as uh, running the radar and so forth. And uh, it was kind of funny. I didn't remember it, but I did a little historical search through the Apollo records and found out that I had written the ICD between the Saturn 
and the Apollo guidance. I don't know where it is. I, ne I never kept it, but I would like to find it. Uh, in 1964, June of 1964, there was what was called the Block II implementation meetings. That's when we described and how we would interface the computer and the rest of the system and how it would work with the RCS systems, the service propulsion systems, and, and so forth with the computer, the CDU information, and so forth. I was at that meeting with John Miller, Don Bowler, Dave Hoag, and some key players at NASA was Klein Frazier, who eventually came to work here and then left, Cliff Duncan, who became a VP at, uh, at Polaroid, Paul Ebersole, who, who eventually took over the GNN activity or the, at, uh, in Houston, and Chuck Wasson, who was a gopher. At that time, I was, a, what, I was the youngest guy there. I was a kid on the block out there. And so I was the guy who was up on the blackboard drawing all this in as we decided. And it was interesting. Uh, I turned around, I said, hey, guys, anybody copy this down? They all looked at me. Oh. So I ran out with Chuck Wasson. We got a Polaroid camera, and we took pictures of every blackboard. These are the pictures of the blackboards. I brought this back, and I asked, I think it was Tributus, I don't remember his first name, to draw, Andy, yeah, Andy Tributus, to draw this up, you know, as our interconnect system. Uh, I couldn't find that drawing, but somehow I turned up, I think Drew had that someplace. And I turned up the negative, so I patched all, turned, patched all the prints together. And that was June 1964, how the command module was going to be put together. And uh, a couple of the players who I was, astronauts, was Jim McDivitt, who was always very instrumental in everything, Ed White, who died in Apollo 1, and Rusty Schwackert, who, who I don't remember, right now remember what bird he was on. And, and over here is a, is a copy of, of that picture. That's the Apollo 2 gyro. Apollo 2 gyro is very interesting. Uh, it was an adaptation of the Polaris gyro with some changes. We changed the um, flotation fluid so we could increase the H. We did some changes with the suspension. Uh, for those who don't know what it is, that's an electromechanical gyro. That was Doc's gyro technology of electromechanical. And on, over here, right in front of uh, the, this table is a, a cutaway uh, or, or piecemeal of the Apollo gyro and the Apollo accelerometer. The story that's most typical, or the one I remember the most because it was a big panic, is we couldn't get any gyros built. None of them would pass a reliability test. And there was a whole series of gyros called 7A. We built 212 of those, 174 were declared as failed. Of the 174 that were declared as failed, 115 were bearing problems. And the bearing problem arose because we had developed a test called the Delta 25 test to determine if there was going to be a problem. And I think 10, 10 micro inch change in the bearing structure would cause a seven Meru, we use Meru those days, um, one Meru was 0.015 degrees per hour shift in performance, and that was defined as a predictor of a future failure. Well, we couldn't get any gyros out. And the IMUs were backing up at the factory. And, and, we, and, the, and it all occurred because somewhere along the way, those little ball bearings right there and there, we went to a finishing process called ball lapping. Wound up ball lapping made a very smooth bearing, but it somehow damaged the surface right underneath the, the ball lapping. And so they all deteriorated with time. Well, we couldn't get the damn things done. Barden was building them. New Departure had stopped supplying them. They didn't want to bother with all this NASA rigmarole. And finally, we hit let contracts to Northrop, Bendix. There were eight, nine, ten million dollar contracts, seeing if we could solve them, the problem. They were doing bearing, trying to do bearing fit finishes by taking a stick, dipping it in diamond dust, and rubbing it against the bearings. It was all sorts of crazy stuff. And out of the clear blue sky, we went to New Departure, and we found a collection of bearings and revive them, and that became the 8A series, and we flew them on most of the flights after Apollo 11 and 12. Uh, so that was the, the gyro problem. Accelerometers, we had a problem. I don't know if Stan remembers this, but we had two problems. One was a stop bias problem, and I don't remember how we fixed that. 
But we also had a problem. There was an O-ring somewhere in the seal. And that O-ring sort of crimped now and again, and we'd get bubbles in the fluid. And if you got bubbles in the fluid as you turn the accelerometer on, around, we got bias shifts. That was solved, uh, as I recall, um, our buddies uh, Gene Fairweather and Ross Cooper and uh, George Bucco worked that. We've solved that problem, and yay verily, we had accelerometers. This is a picture of a PSA tray. You can see the connector there. That's a picture of the CDU tray, and that all used cordwood modules. I'll show you a picture of a cordwood module. We had lots of troubles with this tray structure. This was beryllium. The, the uh, modules were beryllium. And when you got moisture in there, beryllium corroded. Not beryllium, magnesium, I'm sorry. And magnesium corroded. We had all sorts of corrosion problems. And yay verily, we went to hermetically sealed assemblies. That's an idea of cordwood. We did not have large-scale semiconductors in those days, just discrete components. And the way a cordwood, mod cordwood module was put together, you got a block, drilled out all the holes, dropped the parts in, put a board above it to hold it in place, and then welded all the connections. Very rugged, very reliable, pretty costly. This is a picture of the testing of these systems in the system test lab. That was originally being run by uh, Len Wilk. Eventually, Ian Latz took that over. This is the famous picture of Doc up on the roof. Doc wanted a demonstrator. We put a Apollo system in a radar mount up on the roof of then Building 7, and he did his playing up there. And that stuff actually turned into being some use. And, and you see Ed White. I also have a picture, I think, of Buzz Aldrin in this, but I wanted to show Ed White because I was fond of Ed White. And this was a block one system. You can see all the CDUs hanging in there up on the roof. That's the picture of the command module service module going into in the vertical assembly building being assembled. And that's where all of our equipment went in this command module. You can't see all of it, but you can see the IMU, the nav base, the optics, the computer, and, and some call outs of where the CDU and other things went. And there are some statistics there of how big this guy was. Uh, this is the LEM. I couldn't find a similar cutaway to put next to it, but you can see the LEM was pretty complicated setup with an ascent and a descent engine. The descent engine was used in Apollo 13 to, when we were operating as a lifeboat. Uh, the, the descent unit was pretty big, actually across, across the legs diagonally. It was 22 feet across. I'm sorry, 31 feet across the legs. And that's where all of our equipment went in the LEM. And, and in the LEM, we had, didn't have a scan telescope and a, a sextant. We had something called a, op, uh, a optical telescope, which was just a single one, IMU interconnected to it. There were two diskies in, in LEM, I'm sorry, in the command module. And the LEM really didn't have sitting room. You know, that was a stand-up operation. Apollo 13, you had to get three guys in there picture here that I put in, which I, there are lots of pictures of Apollo launch and everything, but I thought I'd show a picture which is different. That's in the vertical assembly building with the command module, on the service module, the LEM, all in the fairing, which all went up here on, on this. And this is the whole system going out on the transporter to the launch pad. And you can see up there is the uh, abort hardware to get us in case the astronauts had a problem. I threw this picture in mostly to show you the Saturn and how big it was. And that's Werner von Braun uh, in front of his uh, five, there were, I think, five engines in this guy. And, and uh, it had an ability to generate seven and a half million pounds of thrust. And it, it burnt for a very short period, uh, getting us up to about 5,000 miles per hour and 38 miles altitude. The S4B, which is the, the final one, did the injection to translunar, and it took 24,000 miles per hour to do that. And that fuel expenditure in that guy was 3 million pounds of fuel. Imagine that. I show that in comparison. 
Uh, this picture came out decades after when the, U when the USSR uh, opened up their records. I think it was under the Russian administration. And, and that's the, the uh, Russian moon rocket, except it never got off the ground. And, and I th always thought one of the reasons it wouldn't get off the ground is that it had 33 engines. And they operated to, to steer using the engines differentially. Can you imagine the plumbing job those Russians had, the Soviet Union had to do? Uh, every one of them blew up in launch within 100 seconds of liftoff. And the very first one, they didn't have a, 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 they weren't too smart about protecting themselves. And the very first one that went off blew up. And I think there were over 100 engineers and site people who died in that very first explosion. Uh, I just list some of the flights, and I, what I wanted to show was Apollo 1, we had the fire. That set us back for a full year. I can tell you a little about that. The 3, 4, and 5 ne never made it. 6 didn't make, make it either. And it wasn't until Apollo 7, 1068, that we had a successful manned flight. It didn't go to the moon. Well, at that time, uh, U.S. government was in a panic worrying whether the Russians were going to get there first, and they moved off with very little success and flew Apollo 8 with Borman, Lovell, and Nerders. Lovell on Apollo 8 demonstrated guidance and navigation, navigation. We didn't do navigation as a prime on the on Apollo program because uh, JPL had the deep space network and they demanded that they do the uh, position determination. Apollo 11 was the Eagle has landed. During the landing, I'll tell you a little bit about that, but that was Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Mike Collins. Mike Collins stayed on the command module. Uh, if anyone knew Neil Armstrong, he didn't make a big deal. He never really would want to talk much about, the, about that. Buzz was the big PR guy, and, and he, he made hay on that. This is the Apollo 1 fire. Happened in 1967 through the whole program into re reassessing and, and a couple of the real problems that they did make changes. One, the hatch in Apollo 1 opened inward. It took about 90 seconds to open. They redesigned that so the hatch would open outward. It took five seconds. Uh, also, the environment in Apollo 1 was 100% oxygen. And one of the things that was in that bird was piles and piles of Velcro. You know, the astronauts floated around, and they liked Velcro to touch to, but Velcro was very inflammable. And that went off, just ignited instantaneously. Uh, and there's a little story that goes with the, why that, all of that happened. But for us, it wasn't a big deal, because we had already switched to hermetically sealed packages. But what it did do for us, if it gave us time to do some software, because every mission, needed a different rope, and that took a lot of time. This is a picture on Apollo 8 of, of Jim Lovell looking through the optics down in the navigation base of the command module. And he demonstrated you could do onboard navigation, and actually he always got, he got as much as two and a half kilo, kilometer agreement with the ground tracking. One of the interesting things, which you didn't see in Apollo 8 movie, was Coming back into Earth, Jim, who was so busy wanting to take shots, he entered the wrong program. And while he was coming in, he entered into the Earth, pre, he, he entered into the pre-launch program, and then he had problems with the IMU, because he had, you know, pre-launch, he course aligned the IMU. And that's when he came up with some capabilities of looking at the sun and the uh, Earth horizon for an alignment visually to find out where he was and then do an alignment. Uh, en route, while, we were, while I was on duty, we had a room called a scammer room. I don't remember what the SCAMA stood for, but we had the scammer room where we at Draper or then MITIL sat around listening to all of the stuff and answering questions. And we could see the data coming down. And some of the data on that bird said, hey, we're not getting any PIPA data. What's going on on one of the accelerometers? And we said, oh boy, do we have a failure? And of course, this is a single string system, you know? One failure, I've had it. You're not going to make the mission. And so we're wondering, is it good? Is it bad? Is it good? And we finally asked them to, to fire some RCS jets to see if it's, it worked. And it did work. 
From that time on, boy, when we calibrated PIPAS, we never calibrated to null it completely. So we go always see the delta Vs. Uh, this is just a picture of, of uh, showing you the, uh, the uh, optical readouts. This is the very first view taken by the astronauts of an Earth rise uh, from the moon side. They took that coming out on the back side. When Apollo 8 splashed down, we were in this scammer room. And you can see Dave ha Hoag shouting for joy. That's me over there. John Green, uh, Bob Booth, Julie Fellman, Ed Copps, and uh, Fred Martin. They're, they were in the software operations. This guy, was at a, this guy was like a recorder. He worked for Raytheon. He always sat there recording everything. So he, he was always in the picture. This is, in Kresge Auditorium, Jim Lovell came and pres presented this picture to Doc in recognition for all the good work we did. And Jim Lovell was an extremely nice guy. If you remember, well, you don't remember. Most of you weren't even born yet, I think. <laughs> but uh, Apollo 8, midnight. <laughs> The astronauts recited uh, verses from Genesis. And, and uh, William Anders recited, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Jim Lovell said it, it called out day and night. And Frank Borman, uh, who was the last speaker, spoke about the waters and heavens to be. It was a very dramatic day. It was probably, for us at an instrumentation lab, probably the most exciting flight. The first time around, all this drama, which, which was part of it. And I have a copy of this uh, document, which I got. I don't remember how I got it, but I got it. And uh, this is the Apollo 11 crew. We can see Armstrong, Collins, and Buzz. This is the launch of Apollo 11. And Apollo 11, a bunch of us were invited to attend that launch. Somewhere in that crowd was us. Uh, and I, I challenge you to find us. I wasn't bald then, so you won't be able to recognize my bald spot. And this is a picture. I, took a, I put this in uh, of President John, ex-President Johnson. He was no longer president at that time. Uh, Richard Nixon had replaced him. And I always say, you see that guy over there? That's not me. <laughs> this is the Apollo mission. I can't go through the whole thing. But you know, we had the launch, the fly out, moon moving, the return. And, and is interesting enough, one, one going out was 334,000 miles. Coming back was 237,000 miles. And, and these are the markers. And all this will be in an archive somewhere. That's a picture that Neil Armstrong took of Buzz Aldrin. And, and I, I have lots of other pictures. And you've all seen the picture, first step on, on, the, on, on the moon and all this business of, you know, first big giant step and the first step for mankind. But I, I like this picture because in this picture, in the visor that you see Buzz, you can see Neil Armstrong and the Lem. They were only on the moon for two hours and 40 minutes. Now, coming down. On Apollo 11, we were getting alarms. The lunar module computer was alarming. I think we got at least four or five alarms saying, hey, we're running out of time, running out of time, running out of time. Well, yeah, we were running out of time. And it was a big diversion for Neil Armstrong. And when he was coming in, uh, it wasn't until the last moment that he looked out because he was so busy worrying about alarms. But the computer was smart. It kept doing the alarms, but it still went on with the landing uh, program. And, and we sent up the message, don't pay attention to the alarms. Uh, I'm not so sure how smart it was. But there was a lot of risk taking in Apollo. And, and uh, Ye Verily saw he was coming in on a crater with boulders. It was a relatively new crater. Uh, and, and when he touched, he had to divert 1,500 feet. And when he landed, he only had 30 seconds worth of fuel left. So it was pretty chancy. That's a picture of the celebration of Apollo 11. And I put it in there because George Schmidt was kind enough to give me some money 
to work on some of these view uh, get these pictures taken. So there's George. There's Tom Fitzgibbon who ran the sim lab of course Dick Batten. Eldon Hall, computer man. Jerry Levine was in the software area or ops area. Fred Martin who was responsible for one of the pro major program areas. Back there in the back is Bill Stammeris who was really kind of a I don't want to call him a gopher, but the, but the man who always helped Dave Hoag out. This is a picture of the Apollo 11 crew when they got out of the when they came back down, they were they were quarantined in a trailer 18 days. That quarantining didn't stop until Apollo 14. And I threw this picture in not not that I admired Richard Nixon, but Richard Nixon greeting them. And what's kind of interesting about that, it started with one president. Johnson was the next president, and Nixon carried it on. It took three presidents to get through the Apollo program. So we'll see how many make it for the new initiative that Bush has just started. Uh, some of the interesting things, and, and, and uh, uh, Apollo 12 was hit by lightning. And, and uh, fortunately, they recovered the IMU because it tumbled uh, in orbit. Apollo 13, I'll tell you a little about it, but one of the interesting things is that the primary pilot for the command module came down with German measles, and they wouldn't let him fly, and they uh, substituted Swaggart, who uh, had like two days of, of training in the vehicle before they put him in. Uh, Apollo 14, by the way, in 1970, with the Vietnam War going on and us being, the, then the instrumentation lab was being picketed and lots of stories on that, but I can't tell you those today. Someday, if you're interested, I can tell you all about the pickets and the confrontations and all of that, which was pretty wild. But in any case, Apollo 14, Don Isles, who spoke here, he gained fame because the abort, the abort switch on the LEM had failed, and it was sending a signal saying, abort, 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 something was wrong. The computer said, hey, what's going on? And Don Isles came up with a four-entry input to the disk key to fake the computer out so that they could land. And they actually landed flawlessly. It was a fantastic landing. Apollo 15 was when they got the rovers <coughs> on board, and uh, 17, which I'll talk a little about because my group had something to do with the gravimeter. Plus, uh, Schmidt, Harrison Schmidt, also called Jack Schmidt, was a board member of, of, the, of the laboratory. This is a picture of Apollo 12. You can see the lightning strike right there. And Dave Scott, an astronaut who I knew, uh, he managed to realign the IMU in orbit with star sightings, and the mission proceeded. And actually, it proceeded so well that we landed, we, we landed within, the goal was to land near the Surveyor 3. We landed within 600 feet of the, of the, of the, of the vehicle. I think the, the, the hope was to get within 2,500. And, and uh, Bean brought back pieces of metal and other stuff from the Surveyor to get an idea of how things handled in the, in the lunar environment that guy landed 31 months before. And you can see the, the lem in the background. Apollo 13, the explosion. That happened uh, somewhere, I'll show you that. But the explosion happened, and boy, all sorts of things start happening at this lab. First of all, the sim lab got turned on uh, with Tom Fitzgibbon and, and several of the people I had in that list. Uh, because suddenly the LEM became the lifeboat for the mission. And fortunately, there was a guy by the name of Bill Tyndall, who was a real key player at NASA. And Bill Tyndall had been throwing software out of the Apollo computers and the LEM computers because nothing we didn't have enough room. You know, we were all ones and zeros and only 72,000 bytes, you know, hardly nothing fit. And, uh, but he didn't throw out the ability of the LEM to push the command module. The issue was we hadn't got coefficients in there to take care of the flight control issues because now the LEM was pushing the command module and the service module, and they were all dead. And so 
in the sim lab, they were busy scurrying around with a real-time computer hooked up into an analog computer, which we did our simulations in. If you know anything about analog computers back then, those guys would crash all the time because, you know, if you got an integrator hooked up wrong, it would run away. But somehow we managed, and we came up with the coefficients necessary, and we sent that up to, to the command module. Those were entered in through the disk heap. Uh, and Tom Fitzgibbons guys led that. In the command module, as you probably know, or maybe you don't know, command module has shut off all the power. And it got pretty cold. It got down to 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, the IMU was never, never tested below 60, because that was the cooling fluid that went through, and that's all we had to worry about. So there was a few questions about, would the gyros work? Would the accelerometers work? And my lab ran out there and tried to cool them down and, and uh, find out if they work. There's a little story that goes with that. I don't know if Bill Sartanowitz is here. Bill Sartanowitz was a technician. He still works here. And we gave him a gyro, and he shoved it. At that time, it was a pretty cool day, cool morning. And we shoved the gyro in his trunk of his car and let it sit out there for four hours to cool down. And then we warmed it up, and yay, verily, it worked. George Bucco doesn't remember how we cooled down the accelerometers, but we were fortunate they all worked. The next question was, would the IMU work? Well, the IMU was designed with the gyros to work at, at the temperature sensor of 137F. We had never done a cool, cool down of an IMU. And if you know anything about floated gyros, there's a damping fluid in there. The gain of the gyro is a function of h, the angular momentum, over c, the damping coefficient. And the gain, obviously, at cold temperatures was pretty, pretty wrong. And so the, the IMU was not stable. And we had to determine how long it would take for it to be stable. I and Lats did some testing. I thought it came up that it took about an hour and a 45 uh, hour and 0.25 uh, minutes or hour to warm up so it would be stable. When we committed to the final entry, there was only one and a half hours left. More luck, just sheer luck, this whole program, you know, if you think about it. We got it up in time. The gyros worked, even though they were never designed to work down to 30 degrees Fahrenheit. The pips worked. It was all single string, no redundancy. And even on Apollo 13, they had to, uh, because there was too much power being drawn in the command, command module, there were devices called BMAGs, which were rate gyros, uh, which was sort of a backup for, for uh, flight control. But they drew too much current. and so. John Aaron had him shut that off. So it was either us or none coming back down or going. And coming down, there was an issue. The Apollo guidance system was off. And I'm almost out of time. No, I still got a little time, I guess. Uh, and and uh, Lovell had to realign the IMU. That was before the, the, uh, return to, the uh, free return to Earth. And uh, he wound up using a technique that uh, he, he learned on Apollo 8. So there was some payoff for his mistake on Apollo 8 because it worked. <coughs> this is the Apollo 13 trajectory. And I can't go through. I put all this in if you ever wanted to look it up. But some of the interesting things was in around this time was when we transferred the coefficients up. Then it wasn't clear because, you know, the transfer of the command module IMU alignment settings had to be done manually from the, from the command module to the LEM. And so the astronauts entered that, and there had to be some transformation matrices done because the LEM IMU was at a different orientation than the command module. So you had to take care of the, the differences. And, and um, Lovell contacted the ground control and said, hey, did I do the right thing? And he did. And entering, before we hit the backside of the moon, there was a question whether the IMU in the LEM was working properly. And they came up with a concept called a sun check. And the sun, that was around 73 hours. The sun check was they put the coordinates for the sun into the IMU. And then 
asked, then of course the, the uh, AOT didn't have any gimbals. So what happened, it had to control the vehicle through the AOT to pick up the sun. And it did. And they said, okay, the IMU is good. We're going to do the return. We, we, we're set up to do PC plus two, which was the burn to move the command module and lunar module you firing on the descent engine to get us back earlier because, and it cut 10 hours off the flight. One thing is there was discussion going out of whether they should turn around and come back. But that was decided not to do because they'd burn all of the descent engine uh, and ha didn't have time to figure things out. So they decided to go do this free return and then a burn to speed up the reentry back to Earth. But more importantly, that burn was to get us in the corridor, safe corridor, and, if, and, and to get into the safe corridor on Earth in the reentry, uh, you had to get into a two degree corridor, and I think it was 5.6 degrees offset. So it was kind of tight. If you came in too steep, you'd dive into the Earth and burn up. If you came in too shallow, you'd pop out and, and wind up orbiting the sun. So that burn, which took place at 79 hours, that was done under, under uh, GNN control, GNNC control, and it was successful. But during the course of the burn, for some reason or other, there was venting and other things, and so they still had to make a, some additional corrections. And they did another correction out here uh, somewhere, and I'm not sure where it was. I couldn't find it in the documentation, uh, but we did another correction. It was a small correction, and that was done uh, with the astronaut, uh, with Lovell, looking at the Earth and the Sun again and, and holding it uh, manually. And this is the, the period of time when the IMU got stable again, uh, Lovell was able to do an alignment, and we came in and splashed down. That splash down was successful. It, we came down at 140 hours and 52 minutes. I'm sorry, that's when we stable, and we came down at 142 hours, and I do mention that was off. It was kind of interesting. Right in around this time, 100 hours, uh, Gene Krantz and his team were trying to figure out you know, all the issues that would be involved, and they sent uh, the guidance, the, the team member then, whose name was Cohen, C-O-E-N, I think that's how you pronounce it, sent him and the goal team to the back room, and the back room was where we were. And, and they wanted to know, hey, would the gyros and things work? Well, in the book by uh, Lovell and I don't remember who, Apollo 13, he's quoted as saying, uh, somebody in Boston had a unit overnight in their station wagon, got down to 30 degrees Fahrenheit, and the next day it started. That's not a true statement. We didn't have anything in a station wagon. We threw the gyros in the back of a trunk in a car. So that, that's what really happened, not that. But it's a good story anyway. Return to Earth, that was the big issue. And there you go. I'm sorry, it's 5.2 degrees offset, 2 degrees <laughs> corridor. And uh, they just had to make it. And as I pointed out, we were coming in at 25,000 miles an hour at 400 nautical miles altitude. And uh, they made it. Got lots of PR, as you know, in the newspapers and everything else. Probably more PR than any other Apollo flight. This is an artist's picture of, of the reentry, and of course, Coming back, they had to get rid of the command module, then the LEM, and then the command module did its entry, had to set up the right attitude for the, uh, for the burn, not their burn, but for the burning environment coming in. And that's a picture of, of, uh, of Lovell, Swackert, and uh, Fred Hayes. Uh, I, I met Fred Hayes at uh, one of the Apollo 25 uh, celebrations, and I didn't put the picture in there because I, we thought it wouldn't be nice to show a picture of my wife and I talking to Fred Hayes, so we didn't do that. But I didn't also put the picture of Jim McDivitt hugging my wife. So 
that's for friends, impress friends. But you're friends too, so what the heck. Anyway, uh, he, if you knew anything about that flight, uh, Fred Hayes really got sick coming in. You know, it was cold, the, the lunar module didn't have any heat. Of course, you know, you may know about the business of too much carbon dioxide in the LEM and the makeshift way of bringing command module containers in with duct tape, they were able to figure out how to hook it up to the LEM system so it would work because the, the uh, containers that took the carbon dioxide out had run out. And so they had to makeshift that. But Fred Hayes told me he, was real, he got real sick. And one of the problems, one of the, rea the reasons why he got real, real sick, besides the fact that they were running out of water and they, and they didn't want to drink because, quote, they didn't have any place to put the urine. Uh, they were using bags and everything to put it in, to, to, to hold it on board, because the ground had told them they needed to get measurements of velocity, you know, know, know what the trajectory was, and they shouldn't throw anything out, out board because it might affect their return trajectory. So they had to hold a, onto all this fluid. Jim Lovell told me that he, Fred Hayes stuck a lac, lac, lactate, uh, Oh, God, I'm losing the word, but it doesn't matter. Stuck something on his, pardon the ladies, on his penis to hold the water. It backed up on him, and he got a kidney infection. <laughs> well, Fred Hayes wouldn't, wouldn't uh, 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 tell me about that part of it, but he did tell me about the part that they wouldn't let him throw the stuff out, so they had to hold it all in, but he really got pretty sick. But uh, it's kind of interesting. This is a picture of Apollo 15. I put it in there because this is a classical picture. You see it all the time. And, and that was the first lunar rover. The first lunar rover traveled 17 miles on the lunar surface, and they put in lots of experiments. Uh, this is the Apollo 17 crew. And uh, that's Harrison Schmidt, Jack Schmidt. Uh, we actually uh, worked with him later uh, on when they were, uh, there was a call for experiments that would fly, and Jack was the scientist. Jack always had this concept, and I still, I still think about it, that there was a, mi uh, a mineral on the moon which was called regolith. And regolith was supposed to have uh, absorbed some hydrogen compound, which Jack said would, if you brought it to Earth, you know, and got the hydrogen out, it would be able to power all sorts of things. So Jack was a geologist. He was a civilian. There weren't too many civilians who flew on Apollo. Uh, Neil Armstrong was a civilian. He was originally a military flyer, but Neil Armstrong uh, was, worked for NASA, and he did a lot of test flying on the NASA flights. I think he flew on some of the very first X-15s or whatever they were. And I think politically, Buzz Aldrin, who was military, wanted to be the first man on the moon. But I think politically they decided it would be best if the civilian was the first man to step on, on the moon. And so Neil Armstrong was the first man on the moon. And, uh, but anyway, uh, Apollo 17 was Jack Schmidt, Eugene Cernan, and Ronald Evans. I think Evans stayed in the command module. On Apollo 17, the Draper Lab, apart from building the guidance system, built something called the Lunar Traverse Gravimeter. The gravimeter was actually put together by Sheldon Buck. He's not here today, I don't think. I don't even know if he's still alive. And, and it, what, what it did was use a accelerometer, D7 accelerometer. It wasn't even manufactured. It was being manufactured, but no longer in manufacture by Bosch Armour. But the principal investigator insisted we use a D7 accelerometer. It was a tiny little one. There's a couple of little ones in the showcase in 1304. 1304 was my original laboratory. My group was the very first group to move to the Duffy building back in, I don't know, 74, something like that, 74, 73, not sure when. Well, we searched the world to come up with D7 accelerometers. We found 13 of them. Uh, we tested them. George Bucco was testing them in my lab, and we found three of them were okay. All the rest did not work because they had all uh, air had migrated into them, and so they didn't work properly. 
one of the ideas that was brought, brought in front of people was, well, get it up in space and pop a hole in it and it would work. But that wasn't done. And that had performance that was better than a micro-G average over a long period. That's the gravimeter. That's when it was all packaged up to take to the moon. And that's a picture of Eugene Cernan deploying it on the moon, making a measurement. That's the lunar uh, vehicle. And I think that lunar uh, transporter, the rover, I think that did 21 miles on the, on the moon surface. And that's a picture of, of Schmidt, the geologist, drilling a hole in some rocks to bring home rocks. On our last flight, Doc hopped up, hopped up on the table and toasted our success. That's Ralph Reagan, Dick Batten, Dave Hoag, that's, I think his name was Lou Larson, who was an administrator of that. Uh, that's John Sequence, he left. And, and there's that same guy, the recording guy, <laughs> always in a picture. And right down there, underneath that elbow area, that's me. I think that's Vince Magna. I'm not sure who that is. And, and that was our escapades of the final Apollo flight. Of course, we flew Skylab after that. And uh, today, this is the announcement by George Bush. And, and he made the announcement that we're going to go back to the moon and on to Mars. And as, as you know, the lab is now working uh, on a program called CER, and the crew, crew Exploration Vehicle, and uh, with a goal of 2014, <laughs> and return to the moon by 2020. And maybe it'll happen. I do have one piece of data that I, I found from one of our administrative documents. And from 1961, through about the middle of 69, this laboratory spent $110 million on the Apollo guidance system. So uh, clearly, we have better tools today and do things faster. But if you take $110 million and do a little inflation factoring, that's a lot of money. I think the original quote on doing the Apollo program by I don't know who it may have been Chilton was seven billion. Maybe that's what it cost. I don't know. Space station cost over eight billion, so gives you some idea. Well, that's it. That's my history of Apollo. No software in it. We we did in this presentation. There were, I think, four or five different software programs that were, were developed. Colossus, Luminary, I don't remember all the name, names. Uh, historically, uh, Eldon Hall published a book called The History of the Apollo Guidance Computer. There's a lot of good information in that. There was a series of reports written at the end of the Apollo program called R700, I think in the library it's stored as R0700, with lots of details on how the, the different systems were, were uh, designed, the different elements of it were designed and what they functioned. It was interestingly enough, I, I, for some reason or other, we didn't put the weights of, of, of units in the report. So. But I did find some of them, like the CDU weighed 37 pounds. I think the computer weighed 70 pounds and so forth. So it was an interesting period. I was blessed being able to be a part of it. And I'm sure anyone else who worked on that Apollo program thought it was a blessing because it was so exciting. And we were too young to realize how risky we were getting people into because we were young people. And, and there's a couple of MIT students here who will hopefully go to take something out to the moon. And they're probably about the same age as I was and we did that. That's it. Any questions? I guess I filled you all in. <laughs>